Welcome everybody. Good morning, afternoon or evening, maybe even good night. Um, welcome at this uh, 17th, 7th webinar. And today we have as our guest Waldo. Um, and Waldo will talk about BC Toolkit, the BC Toolkit for developers. A, a lot of <laughs> different topics, well, all related of course, as it's for developers, but there's quite a, thumb, a couple of things you have to go through the Waldo and thanks for being on our show. Uh, but before I'm going to hand over to you, a couple of uh, housekeeping slides. Uh, last week, uh, we introduced this slide to see if we can get a little bit more response to our uh, survey on five years or our Ariopa and what now. I did get uh, uh, 20 plus uh, responses, uh, which is very nice and thanks to all of them, but I would like to hear more of all of you. And uh, well, Today, there will be quite some of you present at this uh, uh, webinar, and probably there will be even more watching the recording that will be on somewhere, probably during next day. Um, so while I'm talking a little bit, feel free uh, to scan this uh, QR code or use the recording that will be on YouTube later, and then fill in about eight questions. We'll be very pleased if you would do so. So thanks up front. And let's move to the rest of the introduction. Um, your microphone is muted, as you know. I, Luc van Vught, your moderator, will pick up questions. And uh, Waldo and I agreed that I will step in at the point where it makes sense. So I'm not going to wait specifically till the end. Um, so use the questions window to do that, and I will pick it up. Um, as you all know, as I already mentioned, it will be on YouTube on our Ariopa webinars channel. Uh, probably will not make it today. Uh, need to prepare dinner and have some uh, people visiting us. So I'm not going to uh, hurry to get this on at the end uh, of today. But so probably it will be somewhere tomorrow. Um, for those of you that are not yet registered or subscribed to our newsletter, use this uh, URL. Um, while we've, well, as you can see on the next slide, we've already uh, projected, scheduled a number of sessions up to the start of February. So there will be not a newsletter at short term, but somewhere in January. But if you want to be in the know, get yourself uh, registered and uh, get the newsletter in your inbox automatically. So four sessions after this one ahead. So next week, uh, then we get back to the, the normal bi-weekly rhythm. Uh, Dimitri will uh, talk about AI. You could almost say what else. And in January, Bert Verbeek will step in and Andrei Zwierzowski and start of February, Stefanos will step in. And yes, as always, there's a call upon any of you for ideas, for being a speaker, for topics or whatever uh, to come up uh, to help uh, us organize this. So be welcome to send anything. You could even put it as a question uh, on the question window today as a suggestion. So before I'm really going to hand over to you, Waldo, uh, let me thank our uh, sponsor for enough for enabling us to do this webinar and Making user go to webinar uh, makes it a lot easier for us to do the registration. Of course, maybe in some uh, days the teams will take over, but uh, we still don't have a standard tool to get registrations in place. So this works quite nice, I must say. So we're going to start. I'm going to make you <laughs> present it. The floor is yours, uh, Wallo. Well, thank you very much. Um, do you see my screen, Luke? Yes, I see your screen and I can hear you also. Wow. So. That's all. Okay. Look at that. So we're good to go. So yeah, uh, uh, once again, thank you um, for all for joining, but also look, uh, thank you for having me uh, again on, on the channel. <laughs> if, if that is the expression that I should use, um, <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, um, today what I will do is I will actually do a, re, uh, a redo, let's say, of a session that I did at uh, Days of Knowledge um, earlier this year. And if you do not know what Days of Knowledge is, it's actually a pretty interesting initiative from uh, the Directions people. Um, so I, I just went on the website here just uh, just two minutes ago <laughs> to show you this, uh, because I think it's, it's quite interesting. It gives you the opportunity or the company the opportunity to go to a local event um, for yeah, training opportunities, training in anything, B2B, 
Business Central related. Check it out if you're living uh, in the UK, in the Nordics, uh, Denmark, uh, in Germany or uh, basically Central Europe uh, or in the US, there are sessions coming up there as well. Now, this was pretty much already happening last year or basically this, this year. Uh, and I did some sessions there, and one of them is basically, well, what I called D, uh, and with air quotes, uh, PC Toolkit for Developers. I, I mean, this is the worst title ever. What I actually mean is the toolkit that I intend to use when I'm working for anything Business Central. So I'm, I'm going to uh, talk from my own uh, experience, from my own toolkit, and that absolutely does not mean uh, that this is the toolkit. So maybe I should have changed the title. Sorry for that. <laughs> but in any case, um, if I, if if I, if anyone is thinking about the toolkit for anything development, I think yeah, they talk. They, they think about coffee, and I. And that is absolutely not the thing. That is the obvious tool that I could be talking about. Different kinds of coffee. Obviously, that's not what I'm going to talk about. And yes, this. Um, matrix-like visualizations, intentional. <laughs> uh, I, there is obviously a lot, lots of tools that I could be talking about, uh, and obviously I'm not using all of them. So I, uh, I decided to only focus on the tools that I would be using. Okay, and it's still going to be quite a lot, all of these. Okay, so I tried to categorize them a little bit. Um, into, yeah, let's say coding tool, but all, yeah, we are all developers. So basically all of them are coding tools in a way, uh, or at least help with coding or basically make coding easier and all that. But I try to categorize them at least a little bit. So I will be starting with what I call the coding tools. And first of all, these will be the things that I will be uh, talking about first. You see a few of them I already talked about, maybe a few of them less um, less familiar. Um, and do know all of these, except for one lately, uh, I basically tend to use almost on a daily basis. Um, so yeah, let's start with the first one. The first one uh, is absolutely one that, that's absolutely something on, on a daily basis. It's the one from Stefan Maron. Um, he created not really a tool, but a history of uh, Business Central, a history in some kind of repository on GitHub uh, that he basically maintains and makes available for us. I absolutely love this initiative. Um, let me just show you online what that means. If you're not familiar with this one, please bookmark this URL and get yourself a bit. Um, so what is it? it it's basically, um, if you're familiar with the artifacts that we get from um, when we, we work with Docker, we, we can download artifacts and in these artifacts we, we basically can set up a Docker container and these artifacts also contain the code of Business Central. Now you know that we can download pretty much all versions of Business Central or at least all the um, versions that are still supported. Um, which also means that we can download the source code from all these versions. And, and what Stefan Maron did, it created a script that makes all of these versions, the code, available on the GitHub. That's what this is. It's uh, in his repository, msdin uh, 365vc.code.history. And uh, what you will get is a crap load of commits. And all of these commits is actually one version that was, um, yeah, what well, that's that was extracted and uploaded as a version um, in version control in Git. And what you get as well is uh, multiple branches because pretty much all the localizations are being stored as a separate branch. So basically you get the opportunity to not just see the life cycle of the code in terms of the different versions of Business Central, but also the different localizations. And this gives you some opportunities, obviously. So what I do, I, you can already see, I'm not really that familiar with trying to get to the code within GitHub. There is there is like a search engine and you can in GitHub online search code and all that. I don't do that. 
Um, so what I usually do, I basically just take this URL and I clone it uh, locally, and I did that. You just uh, go there, and yeah, this is basically just the same, but cloned, and you see here, I already switched to a certain branch, the PE branch, which is the Belgian branch, uh, and yeah, it doesn't really matter. What I can do now is I can use all the Visual Studio Code tools that I'm familiar with. Like, for instance, I have this sales line open here. It's the actual sales line table of the Belgian version of version 23. Um, and maybe I can look into the file history. So you see here the history of, yeah, you saw that, you see that again, <laughs> the history of the sales line table uh, in all the different versions. And what I already prepared is, this is actually a specific thing that I did actually last week, uh, because there is a new bug introduced in version 23 in the Belgian version uh, that removed apparently one line and you see that here from version 23 to version 20, uh, 22 to 23. Just to indicate like, yeah, you can uh, find out what happened to the source code and uh, this is just from previous versions to the next version. What you could also do obviously is um, compare multiple localizations like compare the Belgian localization with the worldwide localization and see what files have been changed, what is very specific to a certain localization. It's very easy to find out uh, this way. This is pretty much something I, I've been browsing through yeah, pretty much every day. Another example, obviously, is that you can search the, the source code like I did here to maybe search for all the telemetry signals that has been called from source code. And you see here there are like an insane amount of let's say custom signals that telemetry is sent uh, that is sent to telemetry from business quite nice very very cool thing and very much um recommended to check it out if there's any question on how or what is in business central uh, as a developer i think that's very important as a developer to always have access to the source that you are implementing as such well then here is your source so that was the demo. Next two, um, statical prism, something or, or prism, uh, something that I think a lot of us dinosaurs are familiar with. And what is a dinosaur? Someone who has been using CAL as well. <laughs> yeah, that's only like, uh, let's say six years ago, but yeah, that's a dinosaur. It's the previous environment that we were all developing in. Um, there we were using like static CAL, and obviously the CAL stands for CAL, um, and 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 that was actually the only tool that we had to be able to browse to the where used. I have this line of code or this field. Where is that used in standard Business Central? Um, how did that look like? I already opened one uh, here. So basically, you just open an, an export text file. Yeah, I have one here prepared of, of yeah, one of our old products. And that textile was going to be, um, let's say, um, parsed by this tool, by Statical Prism. And then they show you the different example, the different objects. And you were able to, now, pardon me, I'm not that familiar anymore because I have not been using uh, this <laughs> for uh, a lot of times. Um, so when you were able to like uh, go to find the usages and then it was going to analyze for this field where that was used uh, in source code. Well, I'm not going to wait for that one. Here it is. So yeah, that was nice. We have been using that in CAL. Obviously, we are not using CAL anymore. So let me close that down. Oh, let me close that. We are using AL. And static prison now comes with an AL uh, representative for the same thing. So I also opened that here. So you have now the ability to open, let's say, um, um, an entire workspace. I already did that. It takes a while, so so especially for this one, um, to analyze. It's also going to parse your AL files, your dependencies, um, um, and your app JSONs, and, and it's going to put that in, well, here. And now you're pretty much able to do the same thing. I'm not going to be easy, uh, sorry, easy. I'm going to be um, fair and fruitful. I'm not, I'm not really using this. I'm, I'm, 
I'm using VS Code, but the one thing that I find very interesting to see uh, whenever I put this uh, in work is, is this module graph. I really like this one. And you see here, yeah, we have quite a big product. But what this, what this shows me is not the spaghetti, but the levels. If you read it from, if I maybe open the same thing for the smaller repository, then it will be much more clear. This is just my some a tool that I will talk about later on in the session. Um, you see very clearly see like the different apps and how they relate to each other. A dependency graph um, where they also include the Microsoft app, so the application app, the personal performance toolkit, and all that. But what you see is every single a dependency is a certain level. So for level one, level two, level three kind of thing. And if you see that here, it, it's, yeah, sure, it's spaghetti. It's 50 apps with test apps, so 100 apps, um, but only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven levels. And that is actually now quite interesting to start and analyze on, on yeah, where can I, like this print framework, where does it have roots and all that? So yeah, very interesting. And know that it exists out there. Next one. Um, yeah, I cannot talk about uh, coding tips and tricks without talking about uh, VS Code extensions. These days, there are so many. Um, so the one that I will talk about is the one that I created. <laughs> sorry. Sorry about that. Obviously, I'm not the one talking about that. But anyway, I did create an extension pack for um, basically VS Code extensions. Yet again, what I think is interesting. Um, here and there, there are, um, I must say, I reviewed it today. I should maintain it a little bit better as I do, for which I apologize. Um, but in any case, whenever I set up a new PC, a new, like, let's say, virtual machine or whatever uh, that contains VS Code, this is the only extension that I create, the AL extension pack. Um, yeah, and automatically then it will download every single extension that I think is interesting. If you feel there are more uh, interesting extensions, please let me know. Um, and we will consider or I will consider to add them uh, in the pack if that would help you. And then I was considering for this session also to show you some tips and tricks in VS Code. I decided not to do that simply because there are so many, there is so many information already out there. That shows you a lot of tips and tricks. There is these awesome sessions from uh, David Feldhoff and uh, Tobias Fenster. Um, there are some mediocre sessions that I did. Uh, but in any case, there are enough sessions already out there that shows you a crap load of tips and tricks in VS Code, from coding tips, uh, from uh, uh, shortcuts, uh, how to create snippets, create your own extensions, and not. I would suggest, look, uh, that you would add these links in the description of the recording later on YouTube, yeah. and then people can have, have, have access to those as well. We'll do that. It's all YouTube videos. Oh, perfect. Um, okay. There's one more that I did not include in the AL extension pack um, because it's not really AL specific, but uh, it, it's, it's obviously the GitHub Copilot, something that, in my opinion, you should consider. Consider it's absolutely not obligated. Uh, apparently, there is going to be some co-pilot sessions uh, later on, if I understood that uh, correctly. Um, GitHub Copilot gives you coding AI during coding, right? Um, um, I'm just going to show you a few things. Uh, when you see the marketing, uh, they give you immense percentages of productivity or better productivity, in my experience, is absolutely not that immense. Uh, sure, it's interesting to see, uh, but yeah, not yet, I guess, not yet. But I, I have it installed. I give this the opportunity to my team to have it on their system as well. So yeah, sure, as a company, we are paying uh, for their uh, GitHub Copilot if they are interested. Uh, but at this point, it's not that productive or 
it doesn't add that much productivity, in my opinion, for AL development. For me to, let's say, um, make it mandatory for everyone to, to have it as, as a co-pilot for them. Let's, let's just go a little bit into the few things in VS Code that uh, I already talked about. Okay, um, let me try to find this one VS Code that I have here. So, um, what did I talk about? First of all, the AL uh, extension pack. Um, it's basically just an, a pack which will install automatically. If you install this extension in VS Code, it will automatically install the, the list of extensions as you see here. Uh, a few of them probably you're very familiar with. Um, and if not, uh, shame on you. <laughs> um, as I browse through it, uh, I think uh, yeah, I, I should not just work on updating them, but also on updating the names. Uh, one of which, uh, this one is obviously one of the most familiar the, of most of you. Um, contains a crap load of functions, code actions, um, um, and and whatnot. Um, not going uh, in these sessions that I showed you earlier and in the slide, it is talked about quite a lot. Um, one thing that I tend to use quite a lot of this extension is actually the variable declaration. Uh, so just imagine this, if I would do that. This is, by the way, Copilot. Okay, it's not working now. There's demo number one, which fails. Let me test that again. I'm just going to see what I'm doing wrong here. Oh, that doesn't work. First time with symbols. Why did I remove symbols? I have no idea. Well, look at that. When I have symbols, uh, the extension that I just talked about from Andre is able to read uh, the entire symbol tree and now uh, makes my variable declaration a lot more easier. Let's see what I mean. And this is something that I rely on so much. Any, any, any variable that I declare is with his extension. One of the best features of, of, the, of the tool, in my opinion. Um, do know that you need to set that up. Um, let me see if I still remember where that is. Here it is. So we have the AL outline completion providers uh, set up that you need to set up with what, what I did is variable names, but also the variable names with type. And then it will have extra completion providers in my variable section. It's amazing. Remember it. Um, another thing you already saw, Copilot. Um, well, let me show you maybe a little bit more. Copilot is actually very bad in an empty file. And that is because Copilot actually reads the file and is going to try to, well, apply pretty much the same patterns. That's at least how I understand it. So if I, for instance, go to, to another file, which, which has code like this one, um, it has already quite some code, and you see the patterns are pretty much the same all, all the time. So let's now just imagine that I, I want to create pretty much the same function. I'm just going to call it, uh, let's say, jot load. And I will be using, you see, there's no code copilot whatsoever, although the T that I did, it pretty much knew that I was going to declare a text variable. Don't ask me why. Maybe because he read the code and it was able to figure out that it was able to. And look at that, it's already suggesting me to do some things. So that is co-pilot at, at work. But what is really strong, in, like look at this code here, that has some kind of, let's say, a pattern. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm not going to explain what this does, but it's always going to call some kind of function. And if I would start typing, it already knows what I mean. That eleventh item is going to be my new function that I just created. 
That's interesting. And it finds that out because of the manner that this code unit has been uh, created. All of these functions basically need to be called at some point from a certain list. So if I define the list, it already knows here what that list is going to be and what item I would like to add. And that is what Copilot is very strong in. From the moment it sees these patterns, then it will be able to apply those patterns. Do know you can chat with Copilot as well. Um, I must, I must, I, I haven't really had really use case, a good use case other than uh, like in my workspace, how many code units do I have? But I mean, would I ever ask those questions? No, not really. But yeah, it finds that as well. Okay, that's GitHub Copilot. Um, obviously, there's a lot more uh, to talk about that. I actually visited the session on, on directions uh, this year by uh, Jeremy and uh, Dimitri, uh, which was actually quite interesting. Only there I realized that Copilot doesn't see the workspace by default, but only reads the file. And that's, in my opinion, still one of the weak points uh, of the thing. Talking about AI, next tool is something that we all should be getting familiar with, in my opinion. It's a great initiative from this guy, uh, Dmitry uh, Katzen. Um, it's, it's actually, yeah, um, an AI engine that was fed by pretty much every single uh, resource online from uh, the Microsoft Learn to blogs to YouTube um, and so on, um, which basically now gives us a knowledge base of Business Central that was fed that's actually that we can talk to, that we can ask anything. You see here uh, how it might look like. So let me just show you that, um, how it looks like. I can ask anything regarding Business Central. And I can even let it focus on some things, like if I'm searching for an app source, app source app. Uh, is there an app that does I controller? Yeah, controller is, an, is, is, is some software in Belgium that can be used. Uh, and I'm actually searching for uh, someone that has an app and app source that, and there is, it happens to be ours. <laughs> um, or can I deploy an app to on-prem through the automation API? Now do know I can't, right? Default Microsoft Business Central uh, would say, no, you cannot, you need to be in SaaS, well, I'm not going to search an app source for that. You need to be on SaaS for that, but maybe there is a solution for uh, on-prem as well. This is where it should read something from my blog, I hope. Huh. Or not. <laughs> well, I did confuse it maybe with the app source part. Oh, look at that. So it is able to, to find a solution with some code even and so on. And do know in below, you do find some resources that talks about your question. And you can already figure out that, yeah, sure, it, it learns from Microsoft Learn, but it also learns from blogs, but it also, also learns even from Twitter and Twitter posts. How cool is that? Maybe the last one, how to use telemetry. And for this, I would like to see the, um, the system app. I'm not sure this is gonna work. I didn't actually try this before, but I do know there is like a, a telemetry module in, in the system app and it's not really able to, to find mess from that. Yeah, well, it's still AI. AI is artificial intelligence, right? Not just intelligence. Do know this, this tool, the central queue, awesome thing. Uh, it is fed by a lot of resources. You can even see which resources it reads from. And yeah, sure, learn, but also YouTube, also Twitter uh, is one of the big contributors. Also, GitHub is a big contributor uh, in the intelligence of, of this tool. Awesome thing. And uh, any question that you have on Business Central, here is your answer. This is pretty much. Okay. 
Um, another thing online is something that I've been involved with together with uh, Jeremy and Hendrik and, and, and a few others. Um, uh, AJ, sorry, AJ. Um, to, yeah, to kind of like have a beginning of a documentation, let's say, on anything AL guidelines. And we, we baptized it the AL guidelines.dev uh, initiative. Um, oh, sorry, that, the wrong button. Um, and yeah, let me just go online and, and just show you what this is. It's, it's a community initiative. And that means it's created by and maintained by the community, right? And I must say, I, I hit myself on the head uh, from all the ideas I, st that I still have and so low of yeah, things that I already did for it. But in any case, uh, it's actually just a repository on GitHub and or basically a repository of MD files where we try to describe guidelines. And this repository actually ends up as, a, let's say, GitHub pages. So if you go to the docs, you see here, yes, just, just some documentation pages specifically focused on, um, on AL guidelines. And not just AL guidelines, also CAL guidelines we can still find here. Um, Jeremy did a lot of work on transferring all of these to this uh, repository. But for the AL guidelines, you also you already see some design patterns that we think are pretty interesting. Um, some best practices, some coding best practices, let's say. Very interesting to browse through. Um, this is something I always point to. Uh, one, for instance, uh, for an API page that uh, AJ created uh, on what we need to take into account when we are creating APIs. This is a bare minimum. It's coding bad practices. And one of the things, for instance, that I still see a lot of people failing in is providing the minimum amount of fields being the ID and the last modified take time. Just as an example, it's described. And yeah, you can contribute. As I said, it's on GitHub. And you'll see there are quite some discussions already about numerous topics uh, re regarding clean coding, let's say. Please participate. Put up your own discussion, your own topic. Um, and you see here already, like let's say, one more than 100 pull requests by people in the community contributing parts of or full design patterns or coding guidelines. It's a nice initiative, and it needs all the love it can get uh, from from us. Okay, next to Docker, obviously. I mean, who is not using Docker? And if you're not using Docker, then probably you are spoiled by your employer who it is using Docker or some way to provide you a development environment. Um, now, I'm not going to go too much into this. Um, I'm, I, I basically will show you just what I do uh, as for my personal environment. Um, I think I have it here. Yeah, sure. Um, so what I have is pretty much always the same. I mean, this script must have existed in, yeah, you see here more than three years. Um, I for any kind of environment that I set up for my own personal use, like anything that I do for the community or anything like that for training or something like that, it's it's just one script that creates containers, and that's my local development environment. Um, yeah, this is just how how uh, how I'm doing it as as for me personally. Do know in a company. Yeah, sure. I see a lot of companies that does it pretty much the same. Like they basically have a set of scripts they distribute to their developers, and they execute that on their local machine, and that's then their development environment for one or multiple uh, issues or or change requests that I need to do. Um, do know there are other solutions. I will talk about one solution uh, later on in the session uh, that men get, can manage that for you. We, for instance, have our own solution. Um, just going to show you very, 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 very briefly. Um, where we can set up container requests. You see that here um, by matter of templates. And this is basically just a way, let's say, I would like to have like a container for, for this product. 
which means it will set up in the background the container with a number of extensions for it, uh, which will then be a development environment for myself. This is an in-house developed something, absolutely not intended to sell or anything like that, but just as an example uh, of, yeah, Docker is quite interesting. A PowerShell is the first step to provide that as a development environment for uh, for your team. But if you, yeah, you would be able to set it up also as a, let's say, as a service to your team. Let's say with a with a wizard to set it up templates, uh, pre-installed apps, these kind of things. It's all possible. Uh, it's just a little bit more work and a little bit more infrastructural uh, challenges. That's all. But it is possible. Again, I will. Later in the session, show you one more uh, product that can help you with that. Next tool, uh, Dev Toys. Um, yeah, well, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but this is actually an app that yeah I think created by someone at Microsoft. Oh, mistaken. It's, it's this guy Scott Hanselman. I'm not sure. Um, but in any case, it's a tool that you can very simple. Uh, uh, understand and it gives you and basically just like you see here is a Swiss knife, a Swiss multi tool, what not, what not um, for developers. And um, let me just show you. I already opened that somewhere here. So if you open it, you basically just get a number of tools. It's a tool with a number of tools. Yeah, that's a Swiss army knife. Yeah. Um, for instance, to convert. JSON to YAML is not really interesting for us, or timestamp, or creating timestamp, or whatnot. Not really interesting for us, again. But what is interesting, when we go into, for instance, uh, formatters, where we can format JSON files, or SQL, if you're looking into a SQL statement from telemetry, or SQL statement from the debugger, we can simply paste it here, and we'll format it here, XML files. We can generate stuff, like GUIDs, Generate 20 GUIDs. Here are my 20 GUIDs. Generate text if we would have to use text in somewhere or whatnot. Yeah. Or even more text parsing, like for regex text parsing. I use this actually quite a lot. And I prepared an example of an AL file here. I just pasted the entire, I think it's the sales line. Let me just scroll up. Uh, yep, it's the sales line uh, table. And here, I'm just trying out a regex that I'm using in my in my VS Code extension to try to parse the fields from a table. And you see here that it actually seems to work. I'm able to get the field part, the field number, the name, and so on. So cool, my regex works. What else? Well, we have a text diff. Here's just a very simple example where I compare one app JSON with another app.json. And you see here the difference of the two app.json. Does it make sense? Probably not, but at least you have always an, a diff kind of tool um, with this um, dev toy thing as well. Yeah, a lot of things that are useful for um, for for developers and also AL developers, maybe a C sharp developers or uh, or others uh, would have more use for it, but even for AL, this gives me a lot of joy. Okay, and um, next, let's look a little bit into performance tools. A little bit. Um, well, uh, I've been doing the, all these performance sessions and all that, and I'm just going to touch a few tools. There are a lot of, a lot of tools that we could be able to touch. I'm just going to touch a few. First of all, mine, <laughs> uh, .bc Dev tool. Uh, that's not because I would like to promote my tool. Absolutely not. It's not like this gives me any money or anything like that. But I tend to use it quite a lot more than I would have figured when I was creating it. Just because it gives you a very simple way of a very simple way to execute a snippet of code and then analyze it. I'm just going to show you that. Um, Maybe first from the tool itself. So that's absolutely not this one. So pardon me, there was just too many tools here. So the one that I was just working in, like um, this is actually a code unit from my tool. Now let me just go show you the front end. If we go here, 
the intention of the tool is to be able to very quickly execute, let's say, a certain test, a snippet, a snippet of code. And let me, as an example, give you this example, like uh, we have, um, we want to analyze if partial records still make sense. So I created some snippets of code that says, okay, do a fine set, loop it uh, 7,500 times, or do a fine set with the set load fields and do the same thing. And I would like to um, compare this snippet with this snippet. And I have some more snippets because I might have one table extension or two table extensions and some more. Yeah. So always with set load fields or without set load fields. So that, that's kind of like uh, the idea. Just create a snippet and get some metrics. But yeah, what metrics? Well, you see here, uh, all of these snippets are ending up apparently as data in the tool. And when I run it, as you see here, I have a run button, I get metrics like duration. It took me this long to run that snippet. Or there was one SQL statement executing to run that snippet, right? This tool is actually created to have that run button and have that metrics. But obviously, now we have the ability, we can run multiple at the same time with the batch run, for instance, what I did here, obviously. And with, with all of these metrics, you have the ability to, well, analyze. So if you scroll down a little bit, now we have, let's say, some kind of analysis that says, okay, without partial records, that's actually the high bars that you see here, or with partial records, so with set low fields, that's the low bars you see here, it is actually faster. So yeah, it makes sense to look into partial records. And yes, this is V23, where we only have one table extension, and even with one table extension, but in this case, eight table extensions, sorry, even with, <laughs> yeah, even with one uh, extension table, let's say companion table, but still eight table extensions, you speed up the read, let's say by, by 50%. Um, if you apply set load fields. And these are the, this is what the tool is for, to have this kind of very fast, very easy way to analyze. And that's what I tend to be using quite a lot. You see, all of these tests are things that I was wondering at some point and, uh, and testing it. Another reason why I tend to use this tool more and more is, is this flame graph kind of thing. There's just a way, again, I have this run button, you see here, when I run this, I am uh, able to run the performance analyzer as well. You know the performance analyzer from help and support and from analyze performance here. Um, so the in client performance analyzer. So I did that. I just built it in, in the start stop kind of thing from this tool as well. And now I'm able to, let's say, convert that into a flame graph. And which gives me basically a visual interpretation of a profile, which is basically a stack trace in time, right? From left to right, that's the time. And then from uh, bottom to top, that's the stack trace. You see here the actual flow that was actually running while posting an invoice. And this visualizes your process. And uh, it's more and more that I'm using this tool for that reason. So yeah, that's possible. I do know that you're using performance analysis. Uh, the incline profile is not my favorite tool for as a performance profile, specifically because uh, there's a difference in what it measures. Like the AL performance profiles is using the instrumentation way, basically set a um, start end before uh, around every single method, while the inclined performance profile is using sampling, which kind of like means when you see the flame graph again, it will take some snapshot every by default 100 milliseconds, which kind of like means, yeah, it's not able to say that the previous uh, sample has anything to do with the next sample. It's basically just a sample and then the call stack that was running. So you don't really have a hit count and as you see here, it might also miss certain small uh, methods. So for really analyzing performance, the 
in client performance profiler is not really something I would use. It's always the AL performance profiler from VS Physios from VS Code, um, which kind of like means the snapshot debugging feature, the recording that you start and then analyze within VS Code. To know with the incline profile, profile you are able to set the sampling interval, do one for instance, but please don't do that, especially not in the live environment. But environment, it's 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 absolutely not recommendable because it will hit performance in a negative way. Yeah. And yeah, that's actually also what I just did in my tool. Uh, I, I used um, pretty much the same code as the incline perform, uh, performance profiler did in the in that PC Perf tool that I created to be able to track that for my startup. Okay, and then there is telemetry. Obviously, I'm not going to show you all this. We all know what telemetry is. Please switch it on. It's a piece of cake to set it up. And there is so much that we can get from telemetry. There is so, so much. And Microsoft makes it easy for you. They created this, this app source app with, um, with the Power BI dashboard that gives you all the the data and basically the analysis that you can have on uh, telemetry. So yeah, I have a demo. So this is just something that I prepared. This is something that I prepared as well. Um, and you see here, just an overview with, if, once you get familiar with KQL, with query language, which I promise you is worth your time, um then you can get a lot out of this this is just an example of all the signals that for the last 24 hours i was getting for my customers which is a lot yeah there is a lot of information in there yeah and just to give you one example um things that i did like let's let's say a half a year ago we did that we had like internally a very big problem in terms of deadlocking at the customer and telemetry was the only thing that we had. And I, after some time, I created this uh, KQL query, which is actually just, let's say, copy pasting from what Microsoft already has in on their um, BC Tech Samples uh, repository, uh, where you have, yeah. What, what is actually important here is that we look into the call stack. This is just all decompiling the call stack so we are able to figure out let's say the bottom of the call stack which is the source process which is the process that's causing my deadlock and then the top of the call stack which is the object that is actually causing the lock uh, and now we are able to summarize on that and see how many do i have um, for a certain source process so you see here that Let's, let's take this one, is an absolute problem. Well, the top of my problems. This process, whatever that is, the page, apparently, uh, which causes some deadlocking. Uh, where? On this, and this is log locking object. You see 50,000 traces, absolutely something in custom development that we caused as being a problem at our customer side. So we need to analyze this. So the next step, would be in my case i would take this object because that's the problem and i would just go to the next step i will filter on that object you see that here and just try to figure out okay for instance what is the sql statement you have all that information in telemetry so in my case the sql statement is this one you see here select top one that's a find first so apparently we have a find first in this method, which basically gives me all the identification I need to start looking into this actual find first, which is locking apparently. Should it lock? If not, I have my read isolation I can play with, and so on and so on. So yeah, telemetry gives me a lot of data, a lot of things that I simply can uh, query, go to the actual basis of the problem. What, what uh, I've been working on the last couple of weeks is actually um, the combination of not looking into an actual existing problem, but trying to predict a problem. And let's try to keep with me. So uh, if we look at this picture, 
this is what, what picture I tend to use when I explain anything on telemetry. So Business Central, is, you know, there are some people using uh, Business Central, which causes some up insights if you set up telemetry. And then we have like custom queries that you have just seen, or even Power BI that you have seen a screenshot of to get insights into that telemetry. Now, just imagine that we replace these users with Business Central Performance Toolkit that is run from Devils Pipeline in a scheduled manner. Now, we could basically track performance every single day for whatever changes that we do on Business Central, let's say the product, or let's say the customizations of the user. So every day, we basically mimic user usage, fill telemetry, and maybe get alerted from the moment that um, things go bad. Yeah. So this is something, um, again, I'm working on that. It's not something that is still working progress, to be honest. Business Center Performance Toolkit, at this point in time, uh, in my opinion, is not fully ready for it. Um, but yeah, pull requests are being created. <laughs> um, so let's say we are working on it. But and in a nutshell, what this looks like, sorry for this, I'm a little bit struggling. Um, in a nutshell, what this looks like is obviously on the left side, eh, we start with scheduling. Um, business center performance toolkit stuff. Now, just imagine from the moment you have statistics, you want to have a comparison as well. So you basically need some kind of baseline. But in, as a partner, what is my baseline? Is the baseline the, let's say, um, the base up from Business Central? Or is the baseline the product that I created? Or is the baseline the first day of implementation at the customer site? Or is the baseline every single three of these and i in my opinion it's all of these so i need to be able when any whenever i have statistics on any kind of performance i need to have it in the sense of what would the base up be what would it be when i would install my product and only my product but what would the performance be if i would install my customizations at the customer and that in time like today compared to tomorrow and next week and next month and next year so basically I need to schedule multiple pipelines. So I, you see here, I have a base app in this pipeline. It will only install the base app and run a set of um, of, um, of of tests. And you see here in the repository, I will simply have my test uh, code, which does nothing more than, in this case, open the item list, do something, and close the item list. For instance, to follow up the performance of the item list um that's just one example obviously in this one i would also have an, an, an install code unit which sets up my business center performance toolkit now just imagine that it does this and runs this you see here for 20 minutes every single day in a controlled environment then i'm gathering statistics that's basically this part Right, I'm gathering the statistics in telemetry. So the next step is obviously that telemetry, and I prepared that here, would show me the runs of all of these, which basically is just a PCPT log, but in telemetry. You see that all of these things look at, and we're gathering durations, and we're getting number of ste steeple statements. And since we have that, now we can query those and getting alerts of those. So that's the part that I'm still working on. I have just a very simple graph here for you, how it could look like, which actually comes from a run from BCBT. Like at some point, a certain code unit takes longer, more SQL statements. And then at a certain point in time, that same code unit yet again, takes a lot more SQL statements. And this is obviously a graph you do not want to see, yeah? And what I could do is now use metrics. I can create a metric like you see here. I can then subscribe to the metric like I did here. And then you basically get Teams notifications from the moment that one metric, and let me just show you that in history. So on the October 22nd, 
the metric was uh, gone from one status to another status that's i defined myself and that will trigger a notification to myself indicating like hey your product is getting slow obviously this is an example uh, it's very difficult to get that from a really live product uh, which basically is quite stable at the moment so yeah uh, that's why i created this example so but that is all possible when you're using well all of these tools and i think very much interesting last tool that i will talk about today and i see i only have five minutes but i do want to mention mention this because this has saved us a lot of times this translation tools i see a lot going on in the community um a lot of solutions and and a lot of fair solutions and i'm not going to say that we handle translations the best way possible absolutely not um i i've seen partners that are building that in their pipelines we don't i would love to but we don't yet um but how we do that is basically we basically just at some point in time in the in the implementation project we create our translation files uh, for developers uh, so for consultants and consultants need to translate and they are using the um translation tool that comes from the al studio which is a vs code add-in a vs code extension uh that we can install uh on the translation tool and i'm just going to quickly show you that from well, it's white <laughs> look so here yeah, yeah okay so just imagine i would like to translate this app all i need to do is open translation manager which is going to analyze my translations and it says oh well you would like to do this in thai but oh there are zero to do's i already did this in thai oh yeah, no, no i didn't do this so i can simply push the translate button here and the nice thing you see here I, I basically this is my um my translation file right it shows you that in a nice table from the product if you have multiple apps it shows you all of these apps all translation file in one table it can work with the translation memory it can work with translation engines like i'm doing now i'm hmm, what i was about to do now yeah sorry about this i didn't set this up correctly i didn't undo this correctly so that is my problem but you can connect it to an online uh, azure translation service which i did you see here and which now basically just translate all of my captions in thai which by the way works i, I, I checked it uh, my thai is a little bit rusty but i can promise you this is pretty much pretty decent thai. um and that's all it pretty much takes to start translating sure it can work with translation memory as well very much the same as po edit does um but you can now handle like let's say we handle 50 translation files at the same time per language so yeah that makes it very manageable to manage translations as you see it now from the from the al project i don't even need an al project if i just have a bunch of um translation files xlf files well it works with just xlf files uh, as well yeah very interesting you can find the uh, al studio uh, online just al.studio it it is uh it, i mean it's not for free uh but it basically costs as much as uh Bo edit costs and it makes a lot more sense for al translation uh last and uh but not least is just a few mentions on the cicd part if you're still not doing cicd don't break your head over what is best github or azure devops if you started in one of the two then you have started that's the most important part you have started doing ci cd do know there is a free option in github which is algo for github basically let's say an out of the box um pretty much in my opinion uh, inflexible tool but flexible enough to get started basically using CA, uh, CICD, not as an investment area, but as a tool. And the tool acts like it does. If you want to be a little bit more flexible, there is Cosmo Alpaca. And this was a tool that I talked about because this is much more than just DevOps. This is also a solution if you are searching for how to manage my development environments, how to manage 
anything environment, let's say, Cosmo Alpaca is absolutely something that you can uh, check out. If DevOps is uh, the way to go, then Alps is maybe also an opportunity for you, which basically uh, gives you the flexibility that I think you need. And uh, obviously only when DevOps is meant to be, a, let's say an investment area, you need to invest in, in getting to know DevOps instead of just using, let's say DevOps as a predefined tool. And that's all I had to share. Look, I'm sorry, yeah. there is no time for some questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> no, there are also no <laughs> questions at all. So uh, in that sense, uh, you took Dabit on uh, on the time uh, pretty well, I must say. So, uh, Waldo, uh, thank you very much for sharing this. Um, and thanks for everybody being present. I think you gave a, a, a rush through quite a, a number of valuable tools of some, I think, of us did recognize parts, but there are always those nuts and bolts you never get to. So I'm, I'm very pleased that you stepped in and, and shared your, well, things you are using. Um, two people mentioned, thanks for the session. Very useful, thanks. Yeah, so it's clear. Um, it's been a valuable session. That's thank it. Thank you so much. Yeah, so. <laughs> Thank you once more. Let me uh, grab the opportunity to uh, change to my closing slide. And thanks everybody for being here. Um, I will do my best to include, I made a, made some notes while you were talking, while to include the various um, links. Um, I might get back to you to a couple of the links you mentioned first because there was only the description and not the link on it. So, but um, I'll try to get that in place on the uh, uh, comment section so people can directly jump to the right pages. So let's close up for today. Everybody, uh, thanks for being here. Have a great remaining part of the day or what's uh, ahead of you. And um, hope to meet you again next week when Dimitri Katzen will be on the show to uh, talk about uh, um, uh, GitHub. Uh, co-pilot uh, and probably some more I guess thanks thank you